Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, wherever you may be in the world. Um, and welcome to the annual national uh, symposium on biological invasions, um, hosted by the um, Forestry and Agricultural Biotechnology uh, Institute of the University of Pretoria, uh, the Agricultural Research Council, uh, Plant Health Protection, and the Center for Biological Control based here at Rhodes University. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Honorable Minister of uh, Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, uh, Minister Creasy, who in a moment is, is going to address us. And I think we all uh, would like to express our, our sincere thanks um, to the Minister and to her ministry uh, for the support and acknowledgement that uh, they have given over the years to the science of invasion um, and our attempts at, at mitigating, it that, mitigating that. I'd also like to acknowledge my co-chairs of the scientific committee, uh, Professor Bernard Slippers from uh, FABI and Dr. Costa Zachariades from the Agricultural Research Council. I'm in no doubt that all of us would like to be meeting in person. Uh, we'd like to be catching up with old friends and making new friends, listening to the science of invasion over the next three days. However, the circumstances in which we find ourselves prevent us from doing that. We uh, postponed this meeting by a year, and we debated long and hard as to how we should go about it and whether we should postpone it further in the hope that possibly the, the COVID crisis would, would abate slightly and that we would be able to meet in person. But two things drove our decision to, to host the meeting now and to host the meeting in this virtual platform. Firstly, was that there's so much science happening around invasion um, in South Africa and elsewhere in Southern Africa, that we felt to postpone it by another year, we would lose out on, on a lot of that. And secondly, and possibly more importantly, and, and this is something we're gonna to have to think about going forward, the visual platform, the virtual platform that we are in which we are presenting this um, symposium um, this time around, really allows us to be far more inclusive. It allows people who might not have had the opportunity uh, to travel, um, to pay for accommodation, to pay for a registration of the conference. It allows people, those people, to partake in the symposium and also present in the symposium. And I think this is something we're going to have to think about as we go, as, as we go for, forward. Certainly, this uh, format seems to have worked. We have attracted some 400 delegates, and interestingly, from 20 countries around the world. And this is the first time um, that we've this symposium has taken on a truly international um, feel, and I think that's fantastic. And to attract 400 people to this um, symposium on invasion, once again, I think has has um, has been brilliant. We also have um, uh, three excellent keynote addresses uh, coming up, and what I would encourage people do to do is to really remain committed, remain in, um, included in this meeting. Um, don't drift off. Don't drift off and check emails. Don't drift off and, and uh, entertain people coming in and out of your office or wherever you may be. Stay engaged uh, with the content that you're about to, uh, about to see over the next two and a half days. Because I strongly believe that South Africa is at the cutting edge of the science of invasion and the mitigation of, of that invasion. Stay involved. Ask questions. Um, and get as much out of this meeting uh, as you can. All that remains for me to do is to, is to thank our sponsor, Husqvarna, who stayed with us um, over the year that we have postponed this, uh, postponed this meeting. I'd like to really thank the session chairs who have spent a long time um, get, putting together the papers that you're about to see, making sure that they're in the right logical format, making sure that they tell a story from start to finish. Uh, thank you so much for the time that you that you have invested to the National Arts Festival who have assisted us with this virtual platform. Uh, your your um, your engagement with us has been nothing short of spectacular and incredibly professional. And then to the organizing committee chaired by Philip Ivey, including Kim Weaver, Esther Mostert, Kim Canavan and Brett Hurley from from Fabi. I know that you've put a huge amount of work uh, into this conference, a huge amount of hours, a number of hours has gone into it. A lot of blood, sweat and tears has gone into it. Now it's your time to sit back, relax and enjoy the fruits of, of your labor. 
So with that, I, I would like to um, take this opportunity to welcome uh, the Minister of Fo uh, Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, the Honorable uh, Minister Creasy, and ask her to address us. Greetings. I would like to start by acknowledging the Center for Biological Control from Rhodes University and the Forestry and Agricultural Biotechnical Institute of the University of Pretoria as co-hosts of this symposium led by Professor Martin Hill and Professor Bernard Slippers. I would also like to welcome the 350 registered delegates who are attending the event, including conservation officials from Sandpox, Cape Nature, Sandby, and researchers in the field of environment and forestry. Dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are all well and keeping safe in these unprecedented and difficult times we find ourselves in. I am pleased to deliver this address at this important and timely dialogue. I would like to begin by thanking the Center for Biological Control and the Forestry and Agricultural Biotechnical Institute for organizing this event virtually to keep with the tradition of gathering key players in different scientific disciplines and policy spaces to deliberate on the important topic of biological invasions. The theme for this virtual symposium namely Africa acting together against biological invasions is very relevant and appropriate in the light of the reality of the impacts of biological invasions on the African continent, including the uncontained movement of alien species between neighboring countries with negative consequences for Africa's rich biodiversity. This highlights the need for regional cooperation in managing invasive and alien species. Undoubtedly, alien invasive species are among the biggest threats to biodiversity and ecosystem services, food, health, and livelihood. This was recently confirmed by the 2019 Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services that ranked alien invasive species among the top global change drivers of the 21st century. Over the years, South Africa has seen several thousand alien plant, animal, and micro microbial species introduced into the country intentionally or accidentally. We acknowledge that not, not all alien species become invasive. However, it is estimated that over 100 invasive species are having severe impact on our country's rich biodiversity and are reducing the ability of ecosystems to deliver vital services. Consequently, the economic impacts of biological invasions in South Africa are significant and there is the urgent need to intensify actions aimed at addressing them. South Africa has invested substantially in biosecurity and control measures to prevent biological invasions. Our approach is a comprehensive one and includes research, policy, compliance, enforcement, regulation and the clearing of invasive alien plants from many landscapes across the country. Instruments which operate across different government departments have enabled the implementation of biosecurity measures to prevent the introduction of potentially invasive species and agricultural pests. These include requirements for pre-introduction risk assessments, post-border risk assessments, and species listing. All of these have facilitated early detection of new alien invaders. The world-renowned Working 4 programs 
continue to make a substantial contribution to the management of biological invasions while providing significant work opportunities for women and youth in rural areas where other forms of economic activity are often scarce. Our government invests about a billion rand every year in the Working Poor programs. Last year, despite budget cuts, we were able to sustain this important investment through allocations we received from the Presidential Employment Stimulus Program. Substantial investment has also gone into the re research of release of biological control agents as one of the most effective invasive species control strategies. To date, 15 of the 16 invasive plant species or taxa targeted for biological control in our country are under complete control, and a further 19 are under a substantial degree of biological control. Ladies and gentlemen, the link between biodiversity loss and the emergence and spread of disease pandemics is currently in the spotlight in the international arena as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Biological invasions are known to contribute to diseases in different ways. Pathogens can themselves become invasive. Invasive species can serve as vectors of disease. And some invasive alien species are associated with the spread of wildlife diseases. Climate change is, of course, exacerbating the impact of invasives on biodiversity loss and possibly the emergence of diseases. This necessitates a systematic approach in a context-driven research that seeks to enhance our understanding of this link and its implications so that we can develop appropriate management actions. Fostering partnerships across the region has also become necess a necessity. So this symposium provides a valuable opportunity for the research community and policymakers to deliberate on priority research areas for the management of species in the context of climate change. This discussion is urgent, not only to inform national processes, but also global discussions, particularly at, COP, at the CBD COP15, where it is anticipated that the new post-2020 global biodiversity framework will be adopted with a new, a new proposed invasive and alien species targets. We anticipated that the new target will build on the work of the Aichi Target 9 in contribution to the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. To achieve this target, however, requires transformative changes supported by evidence-based research. South Africa's role as chair of the African Union in the past year presented a, an important opportunity to lead the continent in the preparations towards the meetings of the UNCBD, including discussions on the recent meetings of the African Ministerial Conference on the Environment, or AMSIN, and the UN Environment Assembly, focused on enhancing environmental action for effective post-COVID recovery in Africa and strengthening actions to accelerate progress towards achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the goals of the Paris Agreement and Agenda 2063 for the Africa we want. Taken together, these meetings called for the promotion of ecological restoration which is critical for conservation, climate change adaptation, and the provision of ecosystem services, which should also integrate health considerations to avoid potential increased disease risk resulting from intensified human livestock wildlife contact. I would like to take this opportunity to commend the scientific community for the outstanding work it continues to do in producing cutting edge scientific research of immense value here and abroad. The first national status report on biological invasions was the first comprehensive country level assessment on the status of biological invasions across all aspects 
of the problem at a national level. The report continues to be an important tool to assess trends and for setting realistic management targets and to highlight several important gaps in the country's ability to provide evidence to support future decision-making processes. I'm delighted to announce that South Africa recently acquired resources through the, U through the UNIP GEF AIS project to undertake a project entitled Capacity Strengthening for Management of Invasive Species in South Africa to Enhance Sustainable Biodiversity Conservation and Livelihood Improvement. Allow me, as I conclude, to challenge the symposium to look for the best possible ways to coordinate research across our region and to inform platforms such as SADC on how to effectively address alien and invasive species. I wish you all fruitful deliberations. I look forward to actionable outcomes that will help address priority areas in research, decision-making and management interventions for invasives in the future. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Creasy, for those generous and challenging words. Um, and with ongoing support from your Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, the Biological Invasions Research Committee will continue to deliver the research needed to address the threat of invasions to South Africa, the region and the continent. On behalf of the two Kims, Esther, Brett, Welcome to all of you to the National Symposium on Biological Invasions. On Monday morning, Kim Weaver informed me that we had over 390 registered delegates and still more were asking for late registration. Thank you to the National Arts Festival team who, may make, make, who will make sure that you have access to these sessions. To all you presenters, uh, thank you for submitting your recorded presentations on time and mostly keeping to the allotted five or 10 minutes. We have 60 presentations, 21 posters, three keynote speeches, and the opening address, which we've just heard, over the next three days. So punctuality by all of us is essential. Please make sure that you log into the sessions that you wish to attend before the start time indicated on the program. This will allow you to hear the live introduction to the session and in some cases, the live keynote addresses. Some housekeeping. Throughout the symposium, attendees' microphones will be on mute and videos will be off. This means that your opportunity to interact is either through the Q&A box or the, through the chat function. Um, most of you are familiar with those at the bottom of your screens. The discussion and the live presentations will be recorded and available uh, after, the, after the symposium. <clears throat> when the presentations are online, please type your questions in the Q&A box. That is the Q&A box, not the chat box. Please address your questions to the relevant presenter using the, whoopsie, the at symbol and the surname. And is that upside down now? Oh my goodness, there we go, the at and the surname, um, and uh, the presenter's surname to start the question. To assist the facilitators uh, to identify key subjects for discussion, please can you vote um, using the thumbs up uh, uh, to indicate uh, whether you've had a similar question or where you've, whether you favor that question. The facilitators will then invite the panelists to address the questions during, during the discussion time and will focus on those which are most popular amongst the attendees. We will retain the question and answer session um, in a file and discussions can continue offline after the symposium. Please do not place uh, questions to the panelists in the chat box. The chat box is for technical questions regarding the symposium and then loading of relevant links. I believe that the links to the posters will be loaded um, in the chat box. The facilitators uh, will remind you to put questions in the Q&A section. Please keep them so, 
uh, please help them so the facilitators so that the discussion time is meaningful for as many attendees as possible. The present presenters in each session will answer questions live and in the Q&A box. Please attend these discussions to hear the questions discussed. There are workshops at the end of today and the, and the end of the second day. These will be more interactive sessions in that uh, attendees will be able to inter interact directly with um, the uh, facilitators of those workshops. Please make sure that you support Chelsea and Sungai by attending and participating these in these workshops. So in summary, be on time, ask questions, encourage discussion on your question by clicking on the thumbs up, attend the workshop and enjoy, enjoy the symposium. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Caitlin Faulkner from the South African National Biodiversity Institute. And today I will be facilitating this first session of the symposium, uh, which focuses on the first two stages of the invasion continuum, transport and introduction. So unfortunately, I'll be facilitating this session today by myself as uh, Mando Rombadi, who was meant to facilitate with me, has an important meeting this morning, and so unfortunately can't make it. So you're just left with me, I'm afraid. Uh, but hopefully I won't have any technical problems and we'll be able to get through the session without a hitch. So Philip just colored, covered the ground rules, but I'd just like to remind you all, if you have any questions, please would you type them into the Q&A box and any other general discussions or comments, if those could just go into the chat box. So today's first session is essentially split in two. We have a plenary talk, which is followed by a number of presentations. We then have a break for tea, which is 15 minutes long. And then we will be back for more presentations on transport and introduction before having a break for lunch. So to start us all off, we have a plenary talk by Dr. Eckhart Brokerhoff, who is joining us from Switzerland and will be presenting his presentation live. Eckhart is one of the world's foremost forest entomologist and biological invasion specialist, and his work addresses issues such as biodiversity, forest ecology, ecosystem services, sustainable forest management, and landscape ecology. Eki has a PhD in forest entomology and ecology from the University of Toronto in Canada. He's well known for his work as a principal scientist at the New Zealand Forest Research Institute in Christchurch, where he was based for over 10 years after his postdoc. In 2019, Eki moved to Switzerland, where he is now head of the research unit, Forest Health and Biotic Interactions at the Federal Institute for Forest, Snow and Landscape Research. Eki is a very sought after speaker internationally, so we're very lucky to have him join us today. And he has published almost, two, oh, sorry, more than 200 papers, book chapters, and formal reports on forest ecology and biological invasions. Many of these papers are highly cited and have been published in the high impact journals. Eki also serves on the board of the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. So today, Eki will be discussing bridgehead invasions and their implications for management. And there will be time for questions or for him to answer your questions directly after his talk. So please, while Eki is giving his presentation, if you could please type your, present, your questions into the Q&A box and then Eki will answer them once he's finished his presentation. So I'm going to now uh, hand over to Eckhart. Eckhart, uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, good morning and uh, thanks very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I think I've been blushing as I was listening to you. <laughs> and um, but so yeah, thanks very much also for the invitation and for the opportunity to join you um, at this National Symposium on Biological Invasions. Um, I'm, I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak to you. And I think without further ado, I should uh, straight get into my um, 
presentation and um, share my screen with you. And I'll get that out of the way here. So I hope you can see that okay. I assume that means yes. Um, good. Okay, so uh, bridgehead effects in insect and pathogen invasions. And um, I should mention, I'm also an uh, adjunct associate professor at the University of Canterbury still. And uh, this project uh, that I'm going to report on is part of a larger effort of the uh, SYNC Center, the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center at the University of Maryland in, uh, in the US. And uh, so I should uh, acknowledge my uh, co-authors here on, on this also. Um, and then I'll have to get here so I can advance. Yes, good. So uh, this is a summary on cumulative establishments of tree feeding insects in the US, Europe, uh, New Zealand, uh, beginning in the 1800s, uh, in 1800 actually, until 2015 or 17 in, in the case of some of the uh, data sets here. And you can see uh, there's a steady stream of insects that uh, colonize and this is very much uh, a global phenomenon. Um, the majority of these insects uh, luckily are relatively harmless but every once in a while there's one that is very damaging and so this really is a huge problem as I'm sure you're all aware. So the bridgehead effect uh, basically begins with primary introductions from the native range of organisms that colonize non-native ranges as illustrated here. And so sometimes these populations then uh, become bridgeheads and spread further and cause these secondary introductions. And those can either be within a continent or they can also spread further into other continents from there. So transcontinental uh, secondary introductions. Um, the, the term bridgehead effect uh, was first used in this context uh, prominently uh, in this paper by Lambert et al. in 2010. And they reported on the harlequin ladybird Harmonia exeridis that is native to Eastern Asia. And um, it was introduced to North America and also to Europe as a biocontrol agent. But in North America, it's really exploded at huge populations that then spread from there to South America, to South Africa, um, more to Europe also. And in 2016, it was also detected in New Zealand. We don't know about the origin of that, but presumably it's also come from an invaded area. And um, <clears throat> I noticed that uh, the theme of the conference uh, is supposed to make a connection with this unified framework for biological invasions by Blackburn et al. 2011. And so I thought I'd just uh, bring that up here. And there's this, these universal stages of invasions that begin with transport and introduction, then establishment and then spread of invasive species. And so obviously not all species uh, go through all these stages, uh, but some do. And what we can say about bridgehead effects is that they're kind of closing the loop and creating this vicious cycle, if you wish, where the establishment and spread of species <clears throat> leads to more introductions and establishments of non-native species. And um, there have been a number of papers that have already uh, commented on this phenomenon before the 2010 Lombard et paper. Uh, for example, there was this paper um, in Nature in 2004, where the authors reported on the spread and the uh, bridgehead effect occurrence in a lizard that had been spreading to uh, various countries. Um, Bernard Slippers and the team at Fabi have been studying this for the Sarex Woodwasp and its associates. There have been uh, analyses on the pine wood nematode that's causing pine wilt disease where this has been observed. Uh, there was a review paper in 2018 where Bertelsmeier and Keller looked at the potential role of adaptive evolution in the process or whether it's simply just a, a population phenomenon as such. Uh, this was observed in the conifer seed bug Leptoglossus occidentalis. 
And also uh, in the case of the Asian longhorn beetle, there's some indication that some of the invasions may have been caused by this. And here's another example on, a, on termite. So you see, this is uh, quite a common phenomenon. I didn't mention any plants where this is also happening. So what is the cause of bridgehead effects? Uh, basically, a, a lot of invaders are relatively rare in their native range. And often we see that they become very abundant in their non-native range. And that's because there are often very large host resources, especially in the case of plantations, plantation forests and crops that are grown on a large scale. Uh, typically, there's less competition from, from other invaders or other species in, in the same niche, uh, especially if the host is also non-native. And um, there are often also fewer natural enemies, so you get enemy release on top of that. And so as a result, you can have these uh, um, populations growing phenomenally and causing secondary invasions. Uh, here's an example, a uh, pine plantation in New Zealand, which uh, stretches over large expanses. And uh, this is all uh, non-native uh, conifer, Panis radiata, which is native to California. So um, this European pine bark beetle, Halurgus ligniperta, um, invaded there and was detected in 1974. And uh, it's had a huge resource uh, available, uh, little competition um, just from one other uh, European park, park beetle, and there are very few natural enemies. And so this is just what's happening, that this species has become very common. Luckily, it's not a serious pest, but it illustrates the example. So how do we know that bridgehead effects play a role? Um, this is actually very difficult to determine. Uh, firstly, invasions are rarely seen and documented, so these invasions typically happen without anyone noticing and only years later we see that uh, a species has become established and the population has grown. And it's very difficult to retrace uh, where it's actually come from. So, um, but we do have some indirect information from border interception records. So this is when inspector inspect uh, imports at the border or wherever they are delivered and record this information. So we know about movements of organisms from, from these. And uh, also we, we know uh, from population genetic evidence uh, where we have more and more studies that uh, look at relationships between populations in the native and invaded range. So here's some examples. Um, Ips grandicollis is a bark beetle native to North America. It was detected in Australia in 1943 and recently also in China. In New Zealand, it's been intercepted uh, 24 times from its native range in North America and 20 times from Australia where it became established and also became quite abundant. So this just illustrates it's actually being dispersed from both the native region and from the invaded region. Uh, more on this Hylogus ligniperta that I already mentioned earlier. This one is native to Europe and it's been very successful in invading Australia, South America, South Africa, New Zealand and other places. And in New Zealand, uh, there were only five interceptions from Europe, uh, three from Chile, but 19 from Australia. So again, we can see it's uh, moving around from both native and non-native region. Here is an example on ants. Um, so together with Cleo Bertelsmeyer and colleagues, we analyzed 4,000 border interception events of ants from uh, the US and New Zealand. And these secondary interceptions from the non-native range represented 75% in the case of the US and 88% almost in, in the case of New Zealand. And I have a slide on that. So here you can see uh, ants, uh, in each of these columns. And this is their native region, either in Oceania, Africa, Asia, Latin America. And then above the line here, we have the primary interceptions. So interceptions from the native range or secondary interceptions from an invaded range. And so you can see that uh, apart from the Oceanian uh, ants, uh, those that are native to Africa, Asia, and Latin America were mainly intercepted coming from non-native ranges and, and mostly actually in the case of New Zealand from Oceania where these species are established and very common and moved as hitchhikers with uh, containers etc. So about uh, the population genetic evidence, 
recently, in fact, it's a project that's still in progress. We've been looking at Halergus ligniperta because it's a nice example of a species that's been particularly successful in spreading to many places. And so I already, um, so up here we have the native range in, in green and a few question marks because we're not entirely sure what the situation is in, in Eastern Asia. Um, it was first found as a non-native species in Australia in, in the 1940s, and then subsequently in Uruguay, then in Brazil, in South Africa, in New Zealand, in Chile, uh, in the state of New York, in the US, then in California, uh, then in Argentina, and supposedly it's also present in Sri Lanka, although we're not sure about that. So here is a haplotype network that we've constructed, and this was mostly uh, the work of Leah Bischofberger, a master's student who has worked with me. And so she looked at two markers, uh, a nuclear marker, a resin 2, and uh, cytochrome oxidase 1 uh, mitochondrial marker. And she found that uh, the pattern was such that the Argentine and Chilean populations were closely related. Um, those from Italy, New Zealand, and the US are closely related. Um, there is another one from Argentina and Uruguay. And then we have here population, uh, populations from France, Uruguay, and South Africa that are closely related. And more from Europe that were isolated. And generally, there were also the most haplotypes present in the native range in Europe. So what can we learn from this? Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have any samples from Australia at the time. We do now, so but we are assuming that just because it's very abundant and there have been a lot of interceptions from Australia, that the invasion in New Zealand probably originated from Australia. The invasion in Uruguay appears to have come from Europe um, and also that from South Africa, although there's some overlap of uh, haplotypes between Uruguay and South Africa, so there's possibly some mixture uh, between those. And then uh, Chile, uh, we didn't actually find in Europe, but presumably it's a haplotype that occurs in, in Europe, as all these should. And um, that was uh, the source of the invasion in, in Argentina. Uh, finally, in California, uh, both markers show that there's uh, uh, considerable overlap and actually the same haplotype in, in California and New Zealand. And so New Zealand was possibly the source of the invasion in, in California. So we can see uh, bridgehead effects were not involved in all of these, but uh, most probably in, in some of them, uh, especially if we take all the different sources of information together. So a similar picture here for the Sarex wood wasp. Uh, that's a pest in pine plantations in uh, many Southern hem hemisphere countries. It's also invaded in North America and in, in the United States and Canada. And uh, there's also um, uh, quite a bit of movement between these bridgehead populations, uh, although native populations were also probably uh, involved in, in a number of these. It's quite a complex story and it probably hasn't helped that um, these started already in 1900, so there's been a lot of time for mixing to take place. And that's occurred both in, in the Cyrix wood wasp itself and in its fungal associate. And um, so it's a, quite an intriguing story, this. So I should also talk about some pathogens and uh, chestnut blight um, caused by uh, Cryphonectria parasitica that's been a very serious pathogen that's devastated uh, chestnut forests in North America. And uh, that occurred sometime around uh, 1900 already, probably before. And uh, so that population had come from Eastern Asia, from the native range of the organism. From there, it actually spread into Europe and caused uh, chestnut blight in, in Europe, which is still ongoing. And then there was another introduction of a different genotype uh, from Eastern Asia, and that's uh, led to, to some mixing of these uh, different lineages. And uh, most recently, there's been the emergence of a new clonal lineage that has invaded uh, southeastern 
Europe. Um, and so again, we see a, a combination of Bridget effect and uh, uh, primary introduction from, from the native range here, uh, causing this uh, spread between Asia, North America, and, and Europe of a serious pathogen. So to conclude, um, Bridget effects are a common phenomenon in insect and pathogen invasions. And we can compare this to a snowball effect, which is most probably enhancing invasions and impacts. Unfortunately, it's difficult to determine with certainty because there are no direct observations, but we do have some indirect evidence from interception records, population genetics, and also timelines of invasions. And they're likely to become more common as invasions continue to spread. And there are more of these bridgehead populations that can spread further. So uh, really all stakeholders need to do more to reduce bridgehead effects and invasions generally uh, across the biosecurity system. So including prevention, response management, et cetera. And uh, finally, a uh, plug here for the Sysing Center. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for listening and for the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Eki, for, for a wonderful talk. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, Eki's talk has obviously highlighted how invasions are a global responsibility. If we don't prevent invasions from happening, the initial invasions from happening, the global impact of that could be enormous. So we have a question from Sanjeev TV. Um, also, please, could you still uh, put your questions into the question and answer box for, for Eki? Um, Sanjeev asks, how good are molecular tools in tracking biological invasions? Yes, yeah, so there they're good and getting better. Um, obviously, if you find uh, a haplotype in the invaded range, uh, we can assume that in, in most cases that haplotype is also present in, in the native range because uh, they don't change that fast. So um, we, we don't have uh, totally bulletproof evidence, but if you use multiple markers and if you observe the same a uh, haplotype that may be quite rare uh, and presumably having uh, being associated with a population of relatively little propagal pressure in the native range and it's one that's very common in the invaded range and it turns up somewhere else then uh, there's quite good likelihood that that's the case especially if it's also been documented that there is actually movement based on interception records and the timeline suit. So if we take all the evidence together, um, there's a good indication and it's probably going to get better uh, over time as these tools are becoming more and more powerful. But um, I don't think it's totally 100% proof. Like it's not like where you find a DNA sample and you can trace it back to an individual or so. So that is not possible, I believe. Okay, so uh, Philip Ivy also has a question. He asks, he says, thanks, Eki. Uh, can you give some examples of plant invasions that have increased through bridgehead effects? Yeah, so I, I tend to focus more on, on insects and I, I have to admit uh, that um, I don't have a lot of examples um, on top of my head here, but uh, just having a quick look, there was one example that also mentioned it in the literature, and um, it was, uh, God, um, I just have to find this paper now. Um, Boxwood, for example, there's a paper by Leblanc that I'll just published in 2020. Um, yeah. So what I can do is I'll um, I'll look that up and I'll I'll get in touch and give you some examples uh, later. So that came from Philip Ivy. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, Philip Ivy. Yeah, but uh, I believe uh, it's quite likely to to be the case that there are a lot of plants where that's also occurred because there are a number of plants that have spread to multiple countries and we know uh, plant seeds are. 
um, moved unintentionally, like with uh, refrigerated containers, for example, that have ventilation, they suck up uh, seeds from, from plants that are transported across the ocean. With plants, often it's a little bit more complicated because contrary to, to insects where the majority are moved unintentionally, plants are often moved intentionally as ornamentals or crop plants and so on. So, um, but I believe there are also quite a few unintentional movements of, of plants, of non-native plants. Okay, great. Uh, we've, I'm gonna just ask, ask one more question. We're running out of time, I'm afraid. Um, Freedom Shabangu asks, what is the magnitude of the bridgehead effect in the agricultural aspect of biological invasion? So I guess agricultural pests. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's likely to be quite large, um, possibly more than environmental um, pests because they, they have like an extra advantage, uh, agricultural pests to, to get moved around because sometimes they're associated directly with the crops. Also, uh, these crop plants and trees and so on, the reproductive material is traded. Um, and um, yeah, so for example, with the kiwi fruit, wine disease that um, so the the vines on which the uh, kiwi fruits grow um, that is native to uh, asia turned up in italy that was introduced to new zealand by transporting pollen apparently pollen that's used for pollinating uh, kiwi fruit vines and so that's in fact another uh, bridgehead because the introduction most probably came from Italy where the pollen was imported from and uh, it was like an intentional introduction of the pollen and with the lack of knowledge that it's possible to move the pathogen with that. So um, I, I think there, there will be lots and lots of examples uh, that we can think of but again um, it may not always be possible to say with certainty whether it was a bridgehead or a primary introduction. Great, thank you, Eki. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for live questions. Um, I'm not sure if Eki has time to answer any other questions you've got in the Q&A box. Um, but thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, we now have to move on to the other presentations in the session. So up next, we've got three presentations, all from staff and students from Fabi, which focus on invasive insect pests and pathogens of of, alien, of plants, sorry, not avian plants, and how these organisms are moving around the world and the identification of future threats. So just a reminder, if you have a question, please would you type that in the Q&A box while the presentations are being played. Any other comments in that can be typed into the chat box. And you can also like uh, the questions that have been posed so that we know which, which questions you'd like us to, on, to ask live. So we'll now have, as I said, three questions, three presentations, one from Bernard Slippers, followed by Cheyenne Tehran and then Kira Lin. So um, I'm going to hand over to Bernard. Good morning. My name is Bernard Slippers from Fabi at the University of Pretoria. And together with Jan Nagel and Mike Wingfield, I would like to tell you about our work on a group of fungal tree pathogens in the order Botrysweri Haley's that have been moved around the world by humans. And I will start the story by highlighting a project called the Opti Project, which has got nothing to do with fungi or plants, but are producing artworks that depict the interconnectedness uh, through the internet, so internet connections around the world. And if you look at the images that are produced um, over the years, you can see these inc the increasing density of these interconnections. And there's a beautiful video available on YouTube at the moment that you see at the bottom right hand of your screen um, that depicts this growth over the years. And it's of course that which is also keeping us connected at the moment. But we are not only connected electronically, but also physically. We might be traveling less, but we continue to trade uh, various products in very large volumes around the world, including plants and plant parts, live plants and plant parts. This is a massive industry worth more than 100 billion US dollars annually, 
and is also very active in South Africa, both to export plants and to import plants. The problem with this is that this significant growth in the trade of plant and plant parts is also credited with a significant increase in associated pathogens and pests that have been moved and introduced into different parts of the world. What you see depicted on your screen are the, is the growth in pathogens in European forests um, that have rapidly increased in recent years. And the reason for this is easy to understand if one looks at the sheer volumes that are traded. A study a couple of years ago estimated that every inspector in the US with a fairly well-established biosecurity system is um, expected to inspect 43 million plants per year, a task that is simply impossible to do. One of the groups of fungi that have benefited from this is the Botrys radialis. They're very common and widespread stress-related pathogens. They cause dieback and cankers and are well known in agriculture and forestry. But we also see them in our native environments and in our street trees causing decline diseases. And we see this more commonly um, with uh, climate change pressure on many plant communities around the world. A part of the biology of these fungi that is important to the story is that they are typically dispersed over short distances in a rain splash and associated, associated wind. They have sticky spores that are spread from plant to plant in that way. Another part of its biology that's important for the story is that they also occur endophytically inside healthy plant tissues. A study in 1993 discovered them in eucalyptus plants, um, in that case studying eucalypts in Europe and in, in Australia, and showing that these communities are largely different. By 1996, another st study appeared that showed that the Botrysuriaceae were quite common inside the leaves of eucalyptus. Today, we know that these endophytic communities in eucalyptus leaves is incredibly diverse. The study uh, depicting here seeds that we germinated in an incubator and then transplanted into a nursery, we could characterize hundreds of different uh, fungal species inside the leaves of these eucalypts using next generation technologies. And if you consider the taxonomy um, of these microbial communities inside eucalyptus leaves, you'll see that many of them are from the Mycoceralaceae, Theratus radiaceae, with many well-known pathogens amongst them. And this pinkish part at the bottom is the Botrys radiaceae, that is the uh, group of fungi that I'm talking about today. In fact, if we look at different, plant, um, um, different trees where the microbiomes have been studied, we see that many of the fungi inside these healthy tissues are potential pathogens. That's depicted by the green parts um, on these bar plots. So the consequences of these latent infections of the Botrysuriales means that if you're moving fruits around the world, where these fungi sit inside those healthy fruits, or seedlings of plants, or cuttings of plants around the world, you're most likely moving um, significant numbers of infections of the Botrysuriales. Once introduced into a new area, these fungi can then sporulate and infect other plants in the, uh, in the area, not just of the species on which it occurs, because they have broad host ranges. I'll give you a couple of examples. We've studied acacia, for example, in South Africa, and find a species called Botrysuria dithidia very commonly in most areas. So you see um, the, this, this uh, plot depicting many of the different areas uh, that it was sampled in across the country very common fungus on this native tree. But you also find this fungus on eucalyptus in Colombia, on hop hornbean in Europe, or in pistachio in California, or in street trees in Australia, or in apple trees in China. And if we study the genetics of these, we don't see geographically isolated populations, but rather we see dominant genotypes that occur in these human affected areas um, around the world. I can give another example of an ongoing study by PhD student Elawani Ramobulana. She's looking at the Anacadiaceae on Botrysuriaceae that occur in Marula and Fars Marula and Mango. And she's looking at them in isolated parts of the world. Wonderful field um, uh, trips to do to these, these beautiful parts of our country. 
and she finds many different Botrysuriaceae on there, but she finds some common species that I'll highlight through the rest of the study called Lassiodiplodia theobromi and New Fusicocomparvum. And these species also overlap between the native species and the agricultural species, the mango. If you look at mangoes in Taiwan, or quite frankly, in many other parts of the world, you're going to find these same Botrysuria, in fact, these very same species, Lassiodiplodia theoromi and New Fusicocomparvum. If you look at Sizigium along the East Coast, this is a study we've recently published, you'll find Lassiodiplodia theobromi and New Fusicocum quite commonly inside those communities. In fact, if you look further north um, at uh, beautiful baobabs, you'll find again Lassiodiplodia theobromi as one of the common fungi infecting these trees. If we now look at the genetics of these fungi, as we did with the previous species that I um, described a number of different uh, gene regions that we're looking at. Again, you don't see geographic isolation, but rather a pattern of dominant genotypes that must have been introduced into many of these areas quite recently. And the same pattern is visible for new Fusicocomparvum. Dominant genotypes that you find um, spread across many different parts of the world. In fact, the study that appeared earlier uh, earlier this year, uh, took all of the genetic data that's available publicly and characterized these Botrysuriaceae around the world and are showing that there is a number of species that occur virtually in every part of the world, including these three species that I highlighted, and on hundreds of different hosts, 400 hosts, more than 600 hosts in the case of Lassiodiplodia theobromi. So as we're moving these fungi and fruits or in plant material, and introduce them into different parts of the world, they're able to infect many of the other plants um, in the region. So in conclusion, I've demonstrated to you how our, our research is showing that populations of many species of the Botrysuriaceae appear to be connected across the world. These fungi live inside healthy plant tissues as many other fungi, and we tend to overlook this if we think about um, the trade of, of live plants and plant material. And these latent infections can be a very significant pathway for the introduction of pathogens into different parts of the world. I've given examples of Botrysuriaceae here, but there are example of an, examples of a number of other pathogens that likely have spread through this pathways. I've shown you to you how the global databases and the next generation sequencing tools that we have available is helping us track the diversity of these fungi in our trade routes and, 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 and plant communities around the world. But we still have a long way to go to fill the knowledge gaps and develop this technology in a manner in which it can be integrated into our biosecurity legislation and management. With that, I would thank you for your attention and point out that fortunately, it's not only pathogenic fungi that are spread through these networks, but also uh, research connections that might help us to contain these. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining today's session on introductions. My name is Shahan Saran, and I will be presenting on the Ascomycetes fungus Leconosticta photomacri and how it may be a new and important pathogen for pioneer species propagated in the Southern Hemisphere. Firstly, I would like to start with the disease brown spot needle blight. Brown spot needle blight is caused by Lecanostecta acicola. This pathogen was first reported in the USA and later spread to Europe where it is causing outbreaks even today. It was hypothesized that Lecanostecta acicola originated in Central America. In 2019, Fanderneste et al. performed a phylogenetic study using a large data set of tentative Lecanostecta acicola isolates from Mesoamerica. And based on various gene regions, they found that Lecanostecta acicola is not present in Central America. In the study, they did, however, describe four novel species of Lecanostecta. They suggest that Mesoamerica is the center of origin for Lecanostecta species, a genus which now consists out of nine cryptic taxa. American pine species are extremely important for forestry in Colombia. The pathogen Lecanostic dasicola was first reported by Gibson in 1980 on Pinus bachelor and Pinus eliotii. 
Later, the sexual and asexual state was reported by Evans, causing severe defoliation on Pinus radiata. Isolates collected from Pinus carabae in 2011 were sequenced in 2016, and this is though so far the only molecular confirmation of Lycanostectacicola in Colombia. Since 2017, outbreaks resembling brown spot needle blight have occurred on three new species across the forestry zone of Colombia, for which the causal agent needs to be identified. So what we know is that Lecanosteca secola has been present in Colombia for over 40 years. Several new species of the Lecanosteca genus has been described from Central America, and it is known that plant material is moved from Central America into Colombia. Therefore, we would like to determine whether the new outbreaks of needle blight is caused by the established populations of Lecanosteca secola, or whether a new species has been introduced from Central America and is causing the disease. We performed a phylogenetic analysis on the isolates from Colombia using three different gene regions. In the following maximum likelihood tree, each of the colors represents a different species from the genus Lecanostecta. In the top clade in bold are the isolates from Colombia, and in each of the gene trees, they consistently group within the Lecanostecta photomarkley clade. Lecanostecta photomarkley was first described by Van der Nest et al. in 2019, and it has only been reported in Central America. Therefore, this is the first report of the species outside Central America in Colombia, as well as on the new pine hosts, Pinus patula, as well as Pinus maximinoi. Previously, Lecanostecta photomarkley was described only from cultures, so therefore in this study, we could describe what the symptoms look like on the surface of the needles. There is discoloration at the initial site of infection, and in later stages, you see highly erupted black conidia mater that bursts through the epidermis. Cross sections were also taken to determine how the conidioma is embedded in the needle surface, and we also saw variation in the conidia of Lecanostecta pharomacri. Variation was also seen in culture morphology, however, similar to Van der Nest et al., a yellow exudate was also released in the agar for the isolates from Colombia. Taking a closer look at some of the structures on Pinus bachelor, we found a sexual state for Lecanosecta pharomacri, which has not been reported previously. We found that this species has multiloculate ascostromata, and cross sections show that it is embedded underneath the epidermis of the needle. We also managed to photograph the assay and took a closer look at the highline ascospores. The fact that this pathogen is able to complete its life cycle on Pinus spatula is extremely important, given that this Pinus species is widely planted not only in Colombia, but also in South Africa. Successive sexual outcrossing in these populations could increase the genetic diversity of the species, allowing it to adapt to new climates as well as new hosts. This study once again emphasizes the importance of coupling morphological data with phylogenetic data. Evidence suggests that there is anthropogenic spread of Lecanostecta photomarkley from Mesoamerica into Colombia, and therefore in South Africa, given the fact that we plant Mesoamerican pine species, we have the advantage to be prepared and prevent the possible introduction of Lecanostecta photomarkley in the future. With that, I would like Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the opportunity to present some of the work from my masters, focusing on two ambrosia beetle species and the fungal mutualists they harbor. So ambrosia beetles are wood boring insects, the lifestyles of which are spent almost entirely within the xylem of suitable host trees. Here you can actually see a beetle gallery within a felled case across the carpet that was infested. They can survive in this nutritionally poor ecological niche due to their obligate nutritional symbiosis with fungi. Here you can see a fungal garden growing within a beetle gallery, and here you can actually see an ambrosia beetle feasting on its fungal mutualists. They store and transport these microbial mutualists within specialized organs known as mycangia. These mycangia can be located on different parts of the beetle's body, depending on the species, and are depicted in yellow in the diagram to your left. Ambrosia beetles uh, can be associated with a wide variety of fungal species. However, the fungal mutualists found within their mycangia are distinct and defined as ambrosia fungi. I'll be today focusing on a group of ambrosia beetles in the tribe Xylopurini, which contains several important invasive pests. 
several ambrosia beetle species have emerged as important invasive pests globally, and the diseases with which they are associated threaten numerous tree species. An example of this is the accidental introduction of Ulysses fornicatus into several countries, including South Africa. An increase in the number of these ambrosia beetle related diseases is usually associated with activities that facilitate naive encounters between the beetle fungus symbiosis and novel plant hosts. More specifically, the emergence of these diseases is largely attributed to the interaction of the beetle's microbial mutualists and novel plant hosts that lack co-evolved adaptation. Therefore, identifying the fungal associates of these emerging ambrosia beetle pests and determining their diversity and pathogenic potential is pivotal to understanding their disease biology and can provide a basis for better management strategies to hopefully mitigate their impact if they are accidentally introduced into other non-native regions. So in this study, we investigated two fusarium farming Ulaysi ambrosia beetle species that have emerged as pests in their native environment of Indonesia. The overall aim was to broaden the knowledge regarding the diversity of this beetle fungal mutualism. Based on maximum likelihood phylogenetic analysis of the beetle COX-1 gene region, Ulaysi pebrevis in green and Ulaysi simulus in blue were identified as the most abundant ambrosia beetles infesting acacia crassocarpa plantations in Indonesia. We were also able to identify several novel haplotypes of each of the respective beetles. They were easily distinguished based on morphology and also seemed to differ in their ecology, with Ulaysi pebrevis acting as a primary borer able to colonize seemingly healthy plant hosts, whereas Ulaysi simulus appeared to act more in line with the typical ambrosia beetle behavior. It could only colonize uh, plant hosts that were already weakened or colonized by other ambrosia beetles. When investigating the microbial mutualists of these two ambrosia beetle species, we were able to identify three novel Fusarium associates of Ulaysi pebrevis, the most abundant of which was Fusarium reaconum, as indicated by the thick red arrow. The prevalences of these associates did vary and are indicated by the thickness of their arrows. With Ulaysi simulus, we were able to identify five novel Fusarium associates, with Fusarium 1 being the most abundant. As Ulaysi simulus is a secondary borer and can only colonize plant hosts that are compromised or already colonized, we believe it can acquire associates of other closely related beetle species, and is mostly likely why it has a more promiscuous relationship with its microbial mutualist than Ulaysi pebrevis. We were also able to identify another Fusarium associate, but we couldn't confirm its beetle vector. In conclusion, we were able to identify seven novel Fusarium associates of these two ambrosia beetle species. In conclusion, this study gave insight into the diversity of two ambrosia beetle species that have emerged as pests in their native range and which are closely related with other important invasive ambrosia beetle pests. It also gave insight into the diversity of the ambrosia fungi they cultivate. It confirmed that the beetle fungal symbiosis appears to be more promiscuous in nature than what was previously thought when studied in non-native environments. It also showed that these fungal associates seem to have the potential to swap between closely related beetle species and that they can actually recombine with one another. This could result in new, more severe disease outbreaks. Thus, investigating these Fusarium farming Ulaysi species that have emerged as pests in their native environments can give insight into their pathogenic potential and inform future quarantine strategies. And with that, I would like to say thank you for listening. Thank you to my supervisors, my funding bodies, and my collaborators. All questions are welcome. All right. All right. Thank you to the three presenters highlighting the fantastic work that Fabi has been doing. We do have a few questions for you all. So first of all, to uh, Bernard, I hope you're all online as I said, there we go. Uh, yes. To Bernard, if, uh, sorry, what could be the cause of the two species that you highlighted um, are so widespread globally? What could be the cause of them becoming so widespread? So it, it is, uh, can you hear me clearly? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah, so it, it's, uh, it's unlikely that these are spread naturally across such a wide, a wide area given their biology. 
So it, it seems evident that it has spread in plant material where they are, where these fungi are very common uh, endophytic uh, colonists. So that if you look, uh, if you were to isolate, for example, from mango fruits, and, and uh, not only when they start rotting, but you, you are able to isolate these from fruits. They also, if one uh, moves plant materials, so live plant material around the world, either plant, rooted plant material for planting, but also plant parts, you're likely moving uh, numerous infections of these fungi around the world. We also, you know, if, if you, where we often isolate these is that in um, human affected um, environments, so agricultural environments, urban environments, and so forth. So it, it seems uh, the root might be plants and plant material moving with humans and spreading within these human affected, affected areas. So that seems to be the pathway through which these are spreading. So the genotypes that, that are rare or haven't been moved around, presumably those on have a low, smaller host range or those plants aren't being moved around as much? So I, I think we, for many of these fungi, we don't know where an acre branch is. Where we are start studying the broader Botryceriaceae communities in native plant communities, typically where you're going into um, you know, less human impacted environments, you start finding both species and within species diversity, much more, yeah, much more significant diversity than what we find uh, for these common globally distributed uh, species. So I think, you know, within these uh, common globally distributed species, if you are able to find where their actual native ranges are, you'd also be seeing some more within species diversity in those, in those regions. What we're typically sampling would be these common genotypes that are more clearly moved around the world. Thanks, Bernard. Um, and I have a question for JM. Um, it's from Philip Ivey. He asks, are there any pinus cultivars that are resistant to the pathogen? Is it possible for the plantation industry to develop resistant timber trees? Uh, hi, Philip. Thanks for the question. There is ongoing resistant trials for Lycanostecta acicola, and I think there are some pinus palustris resistant cultivars. So it is an ongoing challenge to try and find some ways to prevent it. But uh, it's not in South Africa yet. Okay, great, thanks. Um, then we have a question from John Wilson to Bernard. He asks, um, are some of the fungi, are they already everywhere? If, sorry, if some of these fungi are already everywhere due to historical introductions, is there a general need to focus on plant health then worry about specific issues of introducing them at the border? That's a, that's a very good question. You know, unfortunately, you do find some of these species on, on quarantine lists, uh, for example, where, and sometimes just incorrect names as well, where they really shouldn't be because they're either already in those, uh, in those regions or made, and in many cases, we simply don't know the real distribution of many species. They, many of these really are everywhere um, already. And in some of these cases, just the difficulty of, of managing them at a, at a border um, is going to be prohibitive and we need to ask that question of you know for these that are already everywhere do we really need to focus them and likely not for all of them but it certainly is important that we understand specific species that might be affecting certain hosts and involved in, uh, in, in certain diseases that we try and prevent the spread of, of uh, such species or genotypes. Thanks Bernard. Uh, we now have a question for Kira Lynn. Uh, it's from Sanjeev. He asks, unlike plants, faunal invasions invariably transport pathogens as well. Is there any effort at the land of origin to identify pathogens, parasites, etc., of the prospective invasive fauna? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so in Indonesia, there is a R&D section, so they are constantly researching and monitoring uh, pests and pathogens. Uh, but also with collaboration, uh, specifically with Fabi, uh, we are ongoing um, monitoring what pests and pathogens are there. Um, a really good example of this was the uh, leaf blight pathogen, Teratosphere. 
Um, so there is efforts in this. I don't know the specific details, um, but we are constantly monitoring um, and seeing if this, these pestle pathogens can relate to other countries in the world um, through collaboration. I don't know if that answers the question. Thanks, Kira. I have one um, for Cheyenne. Um, Cheyenne, to what extent do we actually import pine or plants that would bring these um, sorts of, of pathogens to South Africa? I mean, what sort of risk would the pathways pose? Do you know? Um, I think it would be a relatively low risk. I think there are a lot of measures in place to prevent the introduction of these pathogens. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great, thanks. Um, we then have a question uh, for uh, Bernard, another question for you um, from Angela Makamba. She asks, what could the cause of the, oh, both, both of these two fungi, what is the cause of their global spread worldwide? But I think we've actually answered that already. Yeah, I, I, I can just say that the only possible explanation we can find for the genetic patterns that, or the diversity patterns that we see in these populations across its global distribution is human associated movement. There, there is no other logical explanation for that at, at this point. I, I'm thinking, you know, one, if I may just um, add one further point to the question that John Wilson asked, is to remember that I'm using the Botchestery AC here as an example of fungi that spread in healthy plant material that's unnoticed. Um, but there are in, in these endophilic communities many other and some very serious plant pathogens that have an extended phase where they don't express a disease. And we typically on plant material look for disease material and overlook the things that sit within the healthy material. So that, that definitely needs beyond the botrystory AC attention in our biosecurity systems. All right, and Kira, I have a, another question for you. You mentioned um, that these beetles have been recorded as pests in their native range. Is that of native species or have alien species been introduced there that they then cause a problem? Uh, so it's on a non-native species. So it's on Acacia crassicarpa, which is planted there commercially for forestry. Uh, so they've emerged as pests on these non-native species. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I'm afraid that's all the time we have this morning for questions. Um, please do keep an eye on that Q&A box. If your question hasn't been answered live, then the presenters may type in an answer to your question. Um, so we're now going to break for tea and we'll be back at 10.35 for more presentations on transport and introduction. Thank you to all of the presenters and to all of you for, for asking questions. We'll see you back at 10.35. Right, uh, hello everyone again and welcome back. We hope you had a, had a great tea and are feeling refreshed and ready to go again. Um, we will be now continuing the first session on transport and introduction. So there will be some more presentations now on this theme. But I'm first gonna just recap the house rules for you in case new people have joined. Um, just a reminder, your videos and your mics will be off at all times during the symposium. So please do engage with the presenters and the content of the symposium using the Q&A box and also the chat box. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box while the presentations are playing. And if you could please just direct those questions to the presenters using the at sign followed by the presenter's name. If you would like to ask a similar question to one that's already been posed or maybe you if you like one of the questions that has been posed in the Q&A box, please would you give that question a thumbs up and that will help us determine whether which questions we end up asking live. And if you have any general comments, please could you put those into the chat box. So all questions to the Q&A box and all other engagement on the chat box. So this second part of the session is comprised of seven talks and then these will be followed by two posters. Uh, directly after the posters, we will then have a section when the presenters, and this includes both of the talks and of the posters, when they will answer 
your questions. And then the session will end at about uh, 11.50 and will be followed by a lunch break. So just some general information about the session. Uh, we have, as I said, we've got seven speakers in this session. Myself, Josie South from SIAB, Marcus Byrne from WITS, Emily Jones from NMNU, Takalani Nelefule from the University of Pretoria, and Samalesu Mayonde from WITS. These speakers will be discussing the movement of alien species at various spatial scales, plant trade as a pathway of introduction, and a new invasive cactus in South Africa. Their presentations will then be followed by posters from Nesh Havenga from Babi and Nbukhle Magobani from TUT. So without uh, further ado, let's uh, get going on those presentations. Good morning. Today I'm going to be discussing some work we've done on the biosecurity threat posed by the movement of alien species between African countries. Over time, there has been an increase in the number of people and amount of goods entering the African continent. As a consequence of this, there's also been an increase over time in the number of alien species introduced to the continent. This figure, which is taken from a paper published in 2019, shows how the number of alien forestry pests introduced to Africa has increased over time. However, this trend has also been shown for other organisms such as agricultural pests. Once an alien organism is introduced to the continent, it's highly likely that that species could spread and potentially move from the country where it's first introduced into neighboring nations. These movements can either occur through natural dispersal or could be facilitated by humans when they intentionally or accidentally transport species. Species that are native to the continent can also be moved by humans either intentionally or accidentally to parts of the continent where they are not native. In addition to the increased movement of goods and people into the continent, there's also been an increase over time in the number of people and amount of goods moving around the continent. This figure shows how the volume of goods traded between African countries has increased over time. This increased trade and transport could have had an influence on the frequency at which alien species are moving or are being moved between African countries. And so the biosecurity threat these species pose could have changed. We've recently undertaken a few pieces of work that have aimed to improve our understanding of the movements of alien species between African countries. These pieces of work have essentially answered two questions. What is the relative importance of intra-regional spread in comparison to inter-regional introductions? And has this relative importance changed over time? In other words, how important is the movement of alien species between countries in Africa, intra-regional spread, in comparison to introductions from other continents, which is inter-regional introductions. The second question posed is to what extent will the intra-African spread of alien species pose a threat in terms of future invasions? So to get an indication of how important intra-regional spread is in comparison to inter-regional introductions, we undertook a study where we treated South Africa and all other continental African countries as two separate sub-regions. We then developed four introduction route scenarios that describe the introduction of alien species from other continents to each subregion and the spread of alien species from one subregion to another. In order to get an idea of how important these different introduction routes have been in the past and are currently today, we then obtained introduction data for alien birds and insect pests of eucalypts introduced to Africa and calculated how many of these species have been associated with each introduction route. Let's have a look at some results. This figure shows the number of alien species introduced through each of the introduction routes to South Africa at the top and other African countries at the bottom. And please note that the results for birds on the left and those for insect pests of eucalypts are on the right. As you can see for alien birds introduced to South Africa and those introduced to other African countries, as well as insect pests of eucalypts introduced to South Africa, the majority of these species have been directly introduced to these two subregions from other continents. In contrast, for insect pests of eucalypts introduced to other African countries, the majority of these species have been first introduced to South Africa and then have spread from there into these other nations. Therefore, introductions from other continents are important, but for some taxonomic groups or in some instances, 
the movement of alien species between countries in Africa may be more prevalent. We also found that the relative importance of the different introduction routes has varied over time. This figure shows the number of alien birds introduced to South Africa to each of the introduction routes. As you can see, for most time periods since 1850, the majority of alien birds introduced to South Africa have been directly introduced from other continents. However, from 1900, there has been an increase in the number of alien birds entering South Africa from other African countries. And since 2000, more alien birds entered South Africa from other African countries than were directly introduced from other continents. Therefore, introductions from other continents are still very important, but the movement of alien species between countries in Africa could be posing an increasing threat. But what sort of threat will these movements pose when it comes to future invasions? To answer this question, we undertook a global study where we predicted future invasions for 86 well-known invasive species. These species span a wide range of taxonomic groups and occur in all environments. Now, as I said, this was a global study, but today I'll just be presenting the results for continental Africa. So for these 86 species, we obtained information on their pathways of introduction and their impact, and also developed a species distribution model. These data were then used to predict where each species is likely to be introduced, spread, and have an impact in Africa. Now, I'm just going to take you through the methods quite quickly. So imagine, if you will, that these dark lines represent the borders of African countries. We used for each species the information on their pathways of introduction and the species distribution model, as well as socioeconomic data to predict where each species is likely to be first introduced and established on the continent. These countries were called the Countries of First Establishment, or FE. The species distribution models were then used to determine the extent of each predicted invasion. And we determined whether each invasion would only span the country of first establishment or whether it would spread into neighboring countries, which were termed the countries of subsequent invasion, or SI. The information on the species impacts, and as well as socioeconomic and biodiversity data, were then used to predict whether each invasion is likely to have an impact in the country of first establishment and or in countries that are subsequently invaded. So let's have a look at some results. So for just those 86 species, we predicted over 500 future biological invasions for Africa. Almost 50% of these invasions are likely to spread from the country of first establishment into neighboring countries. Of the predicted invasions, 46% are also likely to have impact in the countries that are subsequently invaded. In most instances, there's likely to be impact in both the country of first establishment and in those that are subsequently invaded. But for 10% of invasions, there's only likely to be impact in the countries that are subsequently invaded is not likely to be impact in the country of first establishment. These sorts of invasions are very important because in these instances, there will be little incentive for the country of first establishment to actually prevent the invasion. The predicted invasions are also unlikely to be prevented as most African countries, as shown in this figure, have a low capacity to prevent biological invasions. So our work has shown that the intra-African spread of alien species clearly poses an important and potentially increasing threat to biosecurity. We need to deal with this threat, particularly in light of the recently launched free trade zone. This free trade zone means that goods will only be inspected at the first port of entry on the continent. In order to manage biological invasions going forward, we need to focus on preventing introductions to the continent as a whole. The three species shown on the slide were first introduced to other African countries and then rapidly spread from there into South Africa. I've been told by the experts that we could never have prevented these species from entering South Africa once they had been introduced to the continent. Therefore, we need to cooperate with our neighbours and we need to build on the regional networks that already exist. So if you're interested in the work I presented today, please see the published papers in Barthalia, African Biodiversity and Conservation in 2017, and Global Change Biology in 2020. Hi, 
my name is Josie South, and I will be discussing trends in Southern Hemisphere fish invasions and proposing a route forward for collaborative opportunities within the Global South. Numbers of invasive species are continuing to rise globally. In the next 50 years, Africa is predicted to have a relative increase of 49% in fish invasions and a 16% relative increase in South America. Due to geographical biases in funding and research priorities, the majority of invasion work has been completed in the Northern Hemisphere. This often results in conclusions and recommendations which don't translate into the context of the neo and Afrotropics. We pulled together a group to work out whether there are shared threats and opportunities for collaboration across three case study countries, Argentina, Brazil and South Africa. We first identified shared fish species and their invasion status in each country, of which there are 11 in total. Invasive species accounted for 72% of the shared species pool in each country assessed. All three countries had at least one species as a native, and two of these, the African sharp-toothed catfish and the vermiculated sailfin catfish, also have extralimital invasive populations in both Brazil and South Africa. In this case, we included the extra limital species in the analysis, but defined them here as natives. All identified fishes are present in South Africa in some manner. We considered both currently invasive populations and species which are known to be present in the wild and thus able to become invasive in the future. The intention is to create a roadmap for future collaboration. And this should include addressing species which don't become invasive in one country, but are invasive elsewhere. The shared species pools showed a sigmoidal accumulation curve in both South Africa and Argentina, with Argentina's first introduction date 45 years after South Africa. Brazil, on the other hand, had a logistic accumulation curve of a plateau between 1913 and 1952. 36% of introductions into Argentina were from a Eurasian origin, while Brazil received most from North America and an equal amount from everywhere else. South Africa received most from North America and Africa. In Argentina and Brazil, introductions via aquaculture and fisheries enhancement vectors dominate, with an emerging threat of aquarium trade species in all three countries. Angling species were overrepresented in South Africa as a legacy result of British colonial stocking practices. Vector temporal trends show that the angling vector plateaus off, likely related to legislation and greater awareness of invasive species by anglers. The aquaculture and fisheries enhancement vector introduction show an almost linear rise, but the shared species records stop in the 70s, once again likely related to a shift in native species fisheries as a result of greater awareness. Aquarium trade introductions appear to be increasing with time and can be expected to rise rapidly as research and detection levels intensify across the regions. There was a significant association between vectors and donor countries when stratified by recipients. Data indicates that angling vectors are associated with North American species, the aquarium trade vector is associated with South American species, and the aquaculture and fishery enhancement vector is associated with Eurasian species. Knowing this can help prioritize legislation and biosecurity protocols. Quick look at policy trends between the countries show some obvious differences which are promoting different introduction patterns. All three countries suffer from deficits in budget and implementation capacity. South Africa has strong invasive legislation overall, as does Argentina. However, Argentina suffers from a decentralization of decision making. Brazil, on the other hand, has a problematic policy regarding introductions and the naturalization by decree of invasive species. As a result of these shared threats and differing policy standpoints, we assessed each species for feasibility of testing popular invasion hypotheses, depending on their invasion status, country of origin, and previous research completed. We did the same for management practice developments to highlight where the Global South may find collaborative opportunities to solve problems within their own context. In a similar manner, we also assessed each for evidence as to whether they are shared conflict species, and such might pose a threat to biodiversity, but are likely protected or favored in policy and by stakeholders. This presented the usual suspects of common carp, largemouth bass, and rainbow trout, with the emerging African origin conflict species of Nile tilapia and African sharp-toothed catfish. We would recommend research to focus on these species to avoid further development of wicked problems in management. I want to thank the whole workshop team and acknowledge funding from the CIB and the DSI NRF Saatchi Chair Grant to the late Professor Vile, which facilitated this work. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, colleagues. What I would like to talk about this afternoon 
is traditional medicine as a route for importation of alien organisms. And this is work that I did with uh, two colleagues, Amy Burness and Vivian Williams at Wits University. Firstly, it's important to note that many South Africans use traditional medicine and there are many people consuming this type of medicine. And importantly for us, what is being traded as alien um, plants sometimes comes in as propagules and particularly seeds. We surveyed the South African traditional markets and we found lots of alien plants. And we found huge quantities of alien species. 42 species of alien plants were found, of which 26 species were propagules, and 22 of those were viable propagules. Seven of the viable species that uh, we found are listed as invasive in South Africa, and of the 22 viable species, 21 are known to be invasive somewhere else in the world. Some alien plants have been here so long that most of us think they are indigenous plants, such as the prickly pear, which is actually native to the New World, the Americas, and not to Africa. And to some extent, this is due to traditional medicine practices being imported by immigrant populations. For example, large numbers of Indians arrived in South Africa in the 1860s, and they were brought here as an indentured labor to work on the cane fields of Natal, and those people brought with them their own traditional medicine, and which is known as Ayurvedic medicine, which has been melded into the local South African muti trade. In our survey, we found Anriadera cordifolia, which is a South American vine already established in South Africa. But it's an important weed. As you can see, it's very damaging in this picture. And uh, we've already initiated a biocontrol program against this weed. We therefore decided to throw our net a little wider and to survey alien plants in traditional medicine from communities of immigrants further north in Africa. These include the West African countries of Ghana, Nigeria, and the DRC, and from East Africa, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia. 66 species of plants were recorded in the African immigrant traditional medicine shops. Most of these, 61 of the plants recorded are alien to South Africa. Many of the 61 plants are either a viable or potentially viable form. And the most commonly sold plant parts that we found were seeds. So then we decided to spread the net wider to include China. Why China, you might ask? Well, China is consistently among the top five immigrant contributing communities to South Africa. And South Africa has the largest overseas Chinese population in Africa. Johannesburg has a large immigrant Chinese community that have arrived since the advent of democracy in 1994. So interestingly, Chinese herbal medicine was almost legally abolished by the Republican Chinese government in 1929. But traditional Chinese medicine has emerged as an invented tradition, which was initiated by Chairman Mao and the Chinese Communist Party in the 1940s and 50s. And it was promoted by government institutions from the late 1950s. And when President Richard Nixon, the US president, visited the People's Republic of China in 1972, it led to a worldwide craze in Chinese medicine, uh, and in particular, acupuncture. Chinese traditional markets also sell plants and they also sell propagules. However, many of the components in the remedies are combined as ingredients in a particular remedy according to a set recipe. Traditional Chinese medicine is being carried around the world by the Belt and Road Initiative. In this, China is partnering with 130 countries around the world 
through trade and infrastructure projects. And Tanzania has already signed a memorandum of understanding on traditional medicine with China. Traditional Chinese medicine is already in South Africa. It's not sold in markets here, but it's sold through franchise shops and they produce catalogues of remedies which list their ingredients. The catalogue that we were given by the proprietor of one of four shops in a local franchise listed ailments with their specific remedies and most importantly, the ingredients used in the remedy. We compared the list of ingredients we generated from the catalogue with several weed lists, including the 2016 NEMBA list, the Cabbie Invasive Species Compendium and Randall's Global Compendium of Weeds. We found 125 plant taxa, 51 of which are classified as invasive weeds, of which seven are NEMBA listed and 44 are considered to be weeds somewhere in the world. The alien taxa include the kudzu vine, which is most worrying because it spreads from runners and rhizomes, and it will also spread from seeds if suitable pollinators are present. Although many of the plants we found were not member listed, they do have an international reputation which precedes them, such as the purple nut sedge. Purple nut sedge is a very good example. It's considered one of the world's worst weeds, but it's already here. So should we care or should we utilize it? Or should we allow importation? These are questions that we should consider now, and we can add to that, it is herbicide tolerant. Botanically, the results are interesting because it indicates that the nature of the plant has a major influence on the likelihood of it being used in traditional medicine. The APAC, the umbrellifery or the carrot family, carry a lot of secondary compounds and therefore are overrepresented in the catalog relative to the number of weedy taxa that are found globally. And it's the same with the Lamiaceae and the Fabiaceae, or Fabaceae, that also carry secondary compounds in comparison to the Poaceae, the grasses, which carry very few secondary compounds and therefore are underrepresented in the catalog. It's important to notice that this survey was actually very preliminary. And there are many essential facts that we still don't know, including the volumes, the viability and the form of the plants being moved around. For instance, we don't know if the seeds are in a powdered form or have been sterilized with radiation. And also some plants we know are already here, such as fennel. However, fennel is emerging as an important invasive weed in this country. And we know from our experience with prickly pear that weeds have very, very long lag phases. And in fact, prickly pear took almost 100 years before it took off as a, an important weed in this country. So Denham Schmutz in 2017 examined, examined propagule pressure in English uh, botanical catalogues from nurseries. And what she found was that the invading plants, the invading species were the most popular ones found in the nurseries over a hundred year period. She also found that the invading species were on average cheaper than the non-invading species that were found in those catalogues. So we come to two conclusions that popularity promotes invasion and low price promotes invasion. So what are we to conclude from these results? Well, we know that globalization has brought many benefits to many people, but we also know that it has wreaked havoc on many others' lives as the COVID pandemic has taught us just recently. And we also know that it's wreaked havoc on many ecosystems. The Belt and Road Initiative is going to require surveillance in the future because of its role in traditional medicine. And we recommend that risk assessments and environmental impact classification of alien taxa and socioeconomic impact classification of alien taxa take place on the species that are in this trade. Thank you. Good morning, buddy.
Today so I'm going to be presenting on the first chapter of my PhD studies, where we looked at invasiveness in terrestrial true ferns and tried to gain some insights from an assessment of horticultural trade. To give you a brief introduction, horticultural trade forms the primary pathway of introduction for alien plants across the globe. This is driven by the ever-increasing demand for many ornamental species. This demand has also led to a change in structure in the horticultural trade industry, namely e-commerce being online trade and on-ground trade, also known as brick and mortar, I think is the current accepted term. E-commerce has its own issues. It's far reaching. It is a direct link between the buyer and the seller. And it also has the ability to avoid border controls or buy security efforts. On-ground trade, on the other hand, is known to favor alien species, also results in mass breeding, which brings about a massive scale issue, as well as weak compliance with regulations. So a little bit about ferns. Ferns have a very long history in horticulture, which dates back to the early 1900s, particularly during a time known as the fern craze or pteridomania. In my master's study, we found that they had a high propensity towards invasion based on a bunch of biological traits. And we also realized at that time already that there was an importance in horticulture that was driving their introduction across the world. However, we found a huge un uh, underrepresentation of species in the introduced category and figured that there has to be more species currently introduced across the globe than what is currently known. So for the methods in the study, we looked at developing an inventory of traded alien ferns across six English speaking countries. We considered both on-ground trade and e-commerce trade. And once we had selected all of our species, we lumped them into two categories, those that are non-established, being the category of introduced in their country of trade, and those that had successfully established being naturalized or invasive in their country of trade. Then using GLMs, we looked at various market and species traits to determine the probability of establishment success. So what did we find? In terms of nurseries and species, we have found that non-established species had a higher species richness within the market and that established species had a lower. However, established species were far more marketed or had a higher market presence when compared to non-established species. In other words, they flood the market. Uh, then we looked at family representation. We found that about four or five Six families um, were found to be most evident in the market. In particular, Drab Pteridaceae had the highest number of species that they contributed towards trade. And these highly traded families also produced the, the greatest um, proportion of established species. We also developed our probability graphs. Looking at some market traits, we saw that the number of nurseries or the frequency in which a, a species occurred in different catalogues drove establishment success. Trade um, online or e-commerce also drove establishment success. Manipulability, which was an interesting um, variable that we included, we took this to represent the number of cultivars and variants available for a core species in trade. And we interpreted this as a measure of either probable pressure as in, pop, in popularity and trade, also ecotypic variation, and potentially also the ability for that species to hybridize or be um, altered for, for ornamental purposes. Species that had a high number of cultivars or variants had a close to 100% chance of establishment success. Species traits also included the native range of that species, uh, a finding often found in, in other papers, where species with a larger native range had a higher propensity towards invasion. And species that had successfully established elsewhere had a 40 to more than 40% chance of establishment success. Lastly, a quick look at our species of concern. Those that were invasive elsewhere and had a high market presence included Drapterus erythrosaura, Drapterus cycadina, and Aetheria martyrophorum. Those that had a high manipulability with 15 or more variants included more Draftura species and Polystichum cetiferium, as well as Aetherium felix femina, and lastly Aetherium neponicum, for which there were a particularly high number of cultivars and variants. This is Varpictum that has that beautiful purple coloring that drives their demand. In conclusion, horticultural trade definitely influences invasiveness and in alien ferns. Market traits were drivers of establishment success. 
We emphasize the value of early detection through the screening of horticultural catalogs to identify potential invaders and newly introduced species that haven't yet been recorded, and emphasize that monitoring of this nature should be continued into the future to detect newly introduced species. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation, and just a quick thanks to Nelson Mandela University and to CIB for their ever continuing. Inda, greetings everyone. My name is Takaram Nerufule. I'm a PhD student at the University of Pretoria. And today I'll be sharing with you one of my PhD chapters. And the title of this study is Native Species with Alien Population, the Extent of the Problem in South Africa. And before I continue, I would like to thank my supervisors, Prof. Mark Robertson, Dr. Kathleen Faulkner, and Prof. John Wilson. In legislation, the nativity of species is usually defined at a country level with alien species and native species treated differently for biosecurity and other management purposes. Within a country, there are often substantial biogeographical barriers, and so a taxon that is regarded as native at a country level must still form alien population at a local level. This phenomenon has not been well described in the past and has received little attention in South Africa and globally. In instances where this population were described, different terms have been used. For example, domestic exotics and extralimital species. And note that on most slides, there are pictures of species that are native to South Africa, but which have alien population within a country too. We propose a term native alien population for this phenomena and propose that to qualify as native alien population, this population should be within a country where the species is native. The individuals are moved by direct human agency over a biogeographical barrier to an area beyond species historic native range. The South African example is the Zonopas levis. This excludes native species whose range has expanded slightly due to natural range dynamics, the natural dispersal of individuals to sites that, that were previously not suitable for their establishment, but which are now suitable due to human-induced environmental changes, and species that have become abundant or more abundant in their native range due to human-induced or natural environmental changes. In South Africa, it is not clear which native species have established native alien populations, and their pathway of dispersal is not known. The aims of this study were to compile a list of native alien populations in South Africa and determine their pathways of dispersal. To collect records of native alien populations and their pathways of dispersal, we performed a literature search and made use of online survey and emails to obtain data from the experts. The pathways of dispersal were classified using the CPD scheme. We found a total of 98 native species that have established 184 native alien populations here in South Africa. Taxa with large populations are insects, mammals, plants, and fish, while taxa with low number of populations are amphibians, mollusks, and amphiphods. Of the 98 species found, 42 were vertebrates, 29 plants, and 27 invertebrates. 82 of these were terrestrial, 15 freshwater, and only two marine species. The number of taxa introduced vary greatly across pathways of introduction and significantly between vertebrates, invertebrates, and plants. Release were significantly higher than other pathways, and most vertebrates taxa were introduced through these pathways. For invertebrates, most taxa were introduced as contaminants and escapees. For plants, all taxa were dispersed as escapees. We were not able to assign pathways of uh, dispersal for about 19% of this population across all different taxa. In conclusion, we found a total of 98 species that have established 184 native alien population here in South Africa. The pathways of dispersal for these uh, populations is different and vary in the number of introduced taxa. Of the 98 species recorded, 29 of these have been reported to cause environmental or socioeconomic impacts. One of example is the Xenopus levis, which hybridizes with Xenopus gaili in the Western Cape province. This phenomenon deserves more attention, a dedicated policy, and a management response. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the funders. Thank you. A special thanks to everyone on the screen here who have contributed the data. Salute. This study was not going to be possible if it wasn't for your contribution. Thank you very much. 
Thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And if there is anyone who haven't seen the online database and still wish to contribute the data, you can email me on the email here on the screen. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My talk today is about the discovery of a new invasive cactus in South Africa, Opuntia megapotamica. My name is Samalesu Mayonde. Invasive cacti belong to the family Cactaceae, which has over 1,400 species. Opuntia is a genus in the family and has approximately 180 species. It is native to North, Central, and South America and has cochineal insect as natural enemies amongst others. The world distribution map for the species richness of invasive cacti shows that they are native to the new world, especially in the United States and Mexico. However, they have invaded other parts of the world, including South Africa. In South Africa, more than 35 cacti species are listed as invasive alien in terms of the number regulations, with about 10 invasive Opuntia species, including Angomania. Opuntia Angomania, also known as small round leaf the Prickpipe, is a terrestrial weed invading the savannas, grasslands, and the Karoo biomes in South Africa. It is a succulent that can grow up to 1.5 meters tall and is classified by NEMBA as category 1B invader, meaning it needs immediate control. It is native to the United States and Mexico. And in South Africa, the invasive Opuntia angomania occurs in all provinces except for the Mpumalanga and KwaZulu Natal. Opuntia angomania is one of the least understood species taxonomically within the Cactaceae, with several varieties or subspecies, which differ by the morphology of the cladodes, spines, flower color, and cloidy level. And in South Africa, at least three morphologically dissimilar Opuntia angomania have been recorded, of which are referred to here as lineages, depending on their geographic localities. We have the Opuntia angomania mokopani lineage found in Mpopo. Douglas lineage is distributed between the Northern Cape and the Free States, while the Bedford is found in the Eastern Cape. There is still intramorphological variation within each lineage. For example, in the Mokopani lineage, we have the white and red spines of Angomania, same as the Douglas lineage, where the red spines is mainly distributed across the Northern Cape, while the white spines are found in the Free States. Now, the Bedford lineage in the Eastern Cape contains some yellow and orange flower populations. The variation within Opuntia angomania is also observed in the inconsistency of the natural enemies. For example, in Limpopo, the cochineal insect can visibly be seen colonizing the red spine while not touching the white spines individuals. This takes us to the main aim of this research. For a successful management approach, especially when looking at biological control, we need to sort out the taxonomic mystery. And to do that, I'm using the genetic tools. Kindly note that this study is the first attempt to clarify the taxonomic confusion within the invasive Opuntia angomania in South Africa. And the objective of this research paper is to characterize and discriminate the invasive Opuntia angomania lineages in South Africa using DNA markers. For our methods, the epidermal part of the cladod was collected as DNA sample. Samples were collected to represent the different morphotypes found in South Africa, covering a wider geographic range. Both the red and white spines from the Mokopani lineage in Mpopo were collected, including the Douglas lineage, plus the Eastern Cape morphotypes. I also included an Opuntia angomania vertexana from the United States, the native range. And in addition, a couple of sister species, the invasive Opuntia stricta and Ficus indica from South Africa were included for a better topology of the phylogenetic tree. Genomic DNA was isolated using setup methods and we amplified a plastid region for our phylogenetic analysis. 
Given the higher morphological polymorphisms within the invasive Opuntia angomania, we needed reference individuals in order to confirm the identity of our lineages. 12 sequences of the same gene region were obtained from gene bank to construct our phylogenetic tree. 10 in-group reference sequences consisting of two Opuntia angomania varieties were included together with some Opuntia megapotamica, stricta, and others. Um, two species from sister genera were included as outgroups. So in total, we had about 44 sequences which were aligned to check for the point mutations. Our sequence data matrix consisted of 430 base pairs of which 408 of those were shared characters and 22 were variables. For our results, the phylogenetic analysis yielded a phylogenetic tree of three main clades after 50 million generations. Please note that the numbers above the branch denote the posterior probability, meaning the probability of all the individuals in a particular clade to group together and the numbers below the branch denote the bootstrap support, also known as the clade credibility. Clade A here was quite unresolved, grouping most of the Opuntia angomania samples from South Africa, together with the reference Opuntia angomania varieties from GeneBank, including the Vartexana collected in the native range. However, this analysis couldn't separate um, the Opuntia angomania from Opuntia stricta and Obitilata. Interestingly though, clade B grouped together individuals of Opuntia angomania from distinct populations from the Eastern Cape together with the reference Opuntia megapotamica from Gene Bank. Clade C groups together all the individuals of uh, Opuntia ficus indica. Opuntia umifusa, clusters at the foot of the clade together with Opuntia elata and what was collected to be Opuntia angomania, whose morphology need to be analyzed closely. What is also interesting to note here is that clade A comprising of the North American um, invasive Opuntia angomania, while clade B, which has Opuntia megapotamica, actually native to South America. And I must say that the grouping here is quite an odd one as Opuntia umefusa is North American and closely related to Opuntia stricta, while Opuntia elata is South American and closely related to Opuntia megapotamica. Therefore, the point mutations of individuals in this clade here need to be analyzed further. Looking at the phylogenetic groupings in relation with the geographic locations, Clade A comprises of both the red and the white spines from Limpopo and the Douglas lineage from the Northern Cape and the Free State, including samples from the north of the Eastern Cape province, which are morphologically similar to the Douglas lineage. However, Clade B contains only samples from these remotely isolated populations in the Eastern Cape. Now, adding the morphological polymorphism to the phylogenetic partitioning and the geographic locations, we can see here that the white spines from Limpopo and the free states resembling the vertex sana from the native range are grouped in clade A, together with the red spines from both Limpopo and the Northern Cape, where the remotely populations from the Eastern Cape, which have orange flowers resembling and Opuntia megapotamica submitted in GBUF are grouped together in clade B. And note that the main morphological character observed to be congruent with, phylogeny, with, with the phylogeny is flower color. Clade A comprising of Opuntia angomania has yellow flowers, um, while it's clade B of Opuntia megapotamica has orange flowers. In conclusion, the chloroplast gene region is able to separate the different invasive opuntias in South Africa. The unresolved opuntia angomania clade requires more informative genome-wide markers, such as the AFLPs or SNPs, to further discriminate the different lineages. The orange flower opuntia angomania from the Eastern Cape to, uh, group, grouping together with opuntia megapotamica 
has also been confirmed by cactus experts in the United States and South America to be Opuntia megapotamica. Uh, this is groundbreaking finding. And another breakthrough here is that the search for biological control agent can shift towards South America, which is the native range as opposed to the United States. Our phylogenetic analysis here, um, our phylogenetic grouping follows the flower color polymorphisms, and we are sequencing the nuclear gene region as well for congruency. Thank you very much. Stratosphere destructans is an aggressive pathogen causing defoliation of young eucalyptus trees cultivated outside of their native environment in Southeast Asia and in South Africa. Only the asexual state of this pathogen is known, and in previous study, we found that destructans has an outcrossing mating strategy. The aim of the study was to investigate the genetic diversity, recombination potential, and the global relatedness of seven destructans populations. This was achieved by developing and applying mating type and microsatellite markers to a global collection of isolates. The population from China, Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam had an uneven distribution of mating types, low genetic diversity, and a limited number of genotypes, which would be expected from populations with a dominant asexual cycle. The South African population had a single genotype and mating type, indicating that sexual reproduction is currently not possible in this country. The population in Malaysia showed us a different picture. There was an even distribution of mating types, high genetic diversity, 20 unique genotypes, and statistical evidence of recombination, indicating that Tratosphere destructans has a cryptic sexual cycle in Malaysia. The genotypes generally separated according to their region sampled. This suggests that there have been independent introductions into the different regions, or that the pathogen has evolved in the introduced range over time. All investigated populations represented non-native introductions, but the origin of Tratosphere destructans remains unknown. Asexual reproduction is dominant in most populations, and even though we have not seen the sexual state, sexual reproduction is likely taking place in Malaysia. It is a warning that the right mix of isolates comprising different mating types and the right environmental conditions could lead to sexual reproduction. From a biosecurity perspective, we need to do all we can to avoid sexually driven evolution in an already devastating plantation pathogen. Hello everyone, my name is Nobusha Makubane. I'll be presenting a post on the assessment of Tythonia tuberiformis invasion along Eswatini, South Africa border. Tythonia tuberiformis, known as the wild Mexican sunflower, it is native to central and northern Mexico. It belongs to the Tythonia genus with two well-known invaders, Tythonia diversifolia and Tythonia rotundifolia. This annual weed is found in the Gomazi area in Bumalanga and in cultivated maize fields and alongside of the road. The objectives of the study is to document and characterize the population of the species in Pumalanga, to predict its current and future geographic distribution, to predict its potential distribution, and to conduct a risk analysis. A roadside survey was conducted in the selected villages in Gomazi, shown in figure two, and occurrence records were captured using a GPS. A potential distribution map was developed using data obtained from GBIF and using R, Mixent and AppMap software. From the surveys, only two villages had populations of Tythonia tuberiformis, as shown in Figure 4. New stands have been recorded in Bumalanga Province near the Mananga border post and in Gauteng Province in Pretoria near Pinar River. A potential distribution map, as shown in Figure 3, indicates the dark shaded areas to have the highest climatic potential for the establishment of Tythonia tuberiformis. A risk analysis was also conducted to assist in listing the species under the NIMBA AIS regulation species listing. In conclusion, Tythonia tuberiformis is spreading since it's found in different villages in Gomazi and a new record has been found in Gauteng. It is also a concern since most regions in South Africa are climatically suitable for the establishment of the species. A risk analysis needs to be revised in order to lead the species. I thank you. Uh, 
Right, thank you to all of the presenters for the great presentations and the two posters. I see we've got quite a few questions and we have 20 minutes for questions now before our break for lunch. So let's get into them. Um, first of all, I have a question for Marcus from Devadine van der Kolf. She asks, how are these species being brought into the country? Are some of these plants actively planted and possibly harvested from invasive populations? And do you have an indication of the popularity of the use of these medicines in South Africa? Do we have Marcus on the line? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks, Marcus. I'm not sure you can see me, but anyway, um, that's a massive question. Uh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to ask me all the bits again. Uh, we know about the transport um, because we have actually looked at that. So it comes in a variety of ways, literally from massive commercial um, uh, consignments right through to mum and dad carrying stuff in their suitcase. So it's extremely difficult to monitor. Um, the other question I remember was um, planting. Yes, we, that's a very important part of it. We don't know if stuff is planted here. And that's why we're very worried about the Belt and Road Initiative, because it would be an obvious thing to do is to encourage local um, production of those ingredients, because it would be much cheaper than importing them. So that's a massive issue to think about. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the other aspects of the question. Uh, Devadine asked, do you have an indication of the popularity of the use of these medicines in South Africa? Uh, another good question. Um, short answer is no, but as we said, we have a very large uh, immigrant Chinese population, and we did a tiny survey literally on one outlet, well, four outlets. So we assume it's big, but we've got no idea. Great, thanks, Marcus. Um, and I have one for Josie from John Wilson. He says, as I understand it, the conflict species were introduced a long time ago for angling. Will aquarium introductions therefore pose the greatest future conflicts? And do you have a sense of how willing the aquarium industry will be to regulation? Thanks, John. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, yes, it certainly seems like the aquarium species are going to start becoming more of a conflict species, but the actual conflict itself will be largely different from the aquaculture species due to the way they're being used. Obviously, the aquaculture species were introduced for food sources and income sources, whereas the aquarium species dynamics ends up more being like an, an endangered species trade. And therefore, where you have places like Brazil, which are um, putting a lot of time and legislation into making naturalization by decree laws so people can do um, in-pond aquaculture of aquarium species and moving them around Brazil. That's where you start to get issues. In South Africa, the legislation laws are quite strong regarding this, but you still have issues such as um, the red swamp crayfish in the free state where it's being used um, and seeded into dams specifically for, sorry, um, specifically for um, aquarium trade. And there's not so much that's been able to stop that at the minute. So the dynamics and the way of stopping it and monitoring it, it will be a lot different compared to aquaculture species where people are actively engaging with trying to um, actually culture these things for people to eat. So the monitoring will be a little bit different. Thanks, Josie. Um, and I have a question for Samalesu from Andrew Turner. He asks, is there a plan to sample the Western Cape populations of Apantia in Gomani? Yes, um, in fact, uh, given the fact that now we have found um, evidence that the Angomania in the remotely populations down in the Eastern Cape um, to be a different species and it sort of like sit in the same corridor with some of the populations that are found in the Western Cape. So we are definitely looking at including also the populations from the Eastern, um, sorry, from the Western Cape and see actually what they come up to be like. Yeah. 
Great. Uh, thanks for that. Um, and I have a question for Takalani uh, from Devine um, again. Uh, Takalani, were you able to record the spatial localities of these native alien populations? And if yes, at what spatial scale and uh, is the locality data? Um, I did not uh, look at that since uh, I did not uh, collect these populations myself. So um, these, uh, I looked at these populations by looking at the literature. So I only searched for the uh, peer reviewed journal and also looked for uh, these sorts of populations from the experts. So yeah, I, I didn't uh, record that at a special uh, level. However, we did show where uh, these populations have been introduced to and from in terms of biomes and provinces. I'm not sure if that answers the question. I think it does. Thanks, Takalani. And I have a question for Emily. Um, it's from Diana rodriguez Carla. She asked, what English speaking countries did you survey? Um, I basically looked at um, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, the UK and the USA. Um, also promoted by the fact that they were sort of identified as major trading country, um, countries in, in previous studies. Thanks, Emily. Um, I also have a question for you. Uh, was the uh, type of species and their prevalence any different between the brick and mortar trade and the e-commerce trade? Yes, it actually was. So the we didn't necessarily pick up whether more aliens were via e-commerce or, or more were via on-ground. It was, it was much of a muchness, but there was actually a high prevalence of on-ground trade in itself. So it's still a very well-rooted venture of trade when it comes to ferns. Um, whereas with other species like cacti and orchids and things like that, they've actually noticed that e-commerce is the stronger mode. Um, but on-ground still seems to be a very strong mode of ferns um, trade with ferns. Yeah, that's better for management, I guess. <laughs> yeah. uh, Marcus, sorry, I, I, thought I noted that we'd answered a question that, in fact, that you haven't answered. So if you wouldn't mind taking that now by Chelsea Matei, she asks, what exactly are the threats of these medicinal plants if these plants are not imported to be planted, but rather consumed? Surely the likelihood of accidental introduction into natural areas um, and of them and becoming invasive is slim. Uh, thanks, Chelsea. I, I don't agree um, because you literally just have to think about somebody having a packet of seeds moving from a market into uh, an urban or a rural area and the seeds literally get scattered as they are transported across a vast area. And that propagule pressure just continues day after day after day after each consumer does the same. And this is a classic way of weeds and organisms getting in, uh, introduced into different countries. Um, I think we have to be aware of these things and think about them and make a decision about the uh, impact of such events instead of just throwing up our hands and saying, well, it's probably not a problem. Um, I think the, the possibility for dispersal is massive. And we've tested the viability of lots of these um, propagules with, from other markets, and we've found huge amounts of uh, viability. I don't think we should just allow a sort of laissez-faire response to, well, it's probably OK. Thanks. Thanks, Marcus. Um, I'm now going to take a question from Martin Hill to myself, um, which was, what do you think is more important, road corridors or shared waterways in the intracontinental spread of alien species? Um, Martin, that's a great question. Um, and I think that our road corridors pose a huge threat, but of course, that this road corridors versus shared waterways, I think it would differ where in the continent um, you're looking. Perhaps down south, our road corridors may be playing more of a role, uh, but perhaps up north where you've got bigger rivers those um, shared waterways may be more prevalent um, with regards to spreading invasive species. So we now have another question for um, Mayonde. Uh, what follows the identification of this new species of Rapuntia? 
As I understand, South Africa probably could have many other species embedded into the genus complex, so more species are yet to be identified. How, is, how do we communicate this to, for example, people involved in selling a Pantia species? Um, yes, thank you very much, uh, Diana. I think, uh, first First of all, we just have to make sure that what we have found actually is published. So I'm currently working on trying to publish this particular work so that we can get it to the broader scientific community. However, um, also we need to start with the process of looking at if this particular uh, new uh, invasive species now can, can be listed and also looking at more of what kind of um, environmental impact it has and social impact as well. And also looking at basically trying to um, minimize or rather stop even the um, propagation or rather the spread of it. Um, but then you're really right that the species complexity within the um, Opuntia is quite, um, is quite big. So we just try to make sure that we include as many species that we can identify as possible. Thanks very much. Um, I have now a question for, for Josie. Uh, Josie, it seems that the aquarium trade is, is the big future threat in all three of these countries. Um, and we do seem to share a lot of invasive species. Would you recommend that we study the aquarium trade in these other uh, countries, the South American countries, to get an idea of what might come into our trade in the future and potentially pose a threat? Certainly, um, all of the sort of information coming out at the minute regarding invasiveness and pet trade, um, they're definitely very, very related. Um, what's interesting also is that a lot of the popular aquarium fish that are becoming invasive are native to certain parts of Brazil anyway. So it gives quite a nice opportunity for some shared collaborative experiments, field work, looking at what establishes where and what doesn't considering lots of these things are very small aquarium fish. Um, so th there's, a, there's a lot of opportunities where we could create some nice hypotheses and work together to actually move forward. Awesome. Uh, Takalani, there's a, a question here for you um, from Shabalala. She ha they have a, just want some clarification. I may have missed the definition of a native alien population. Please can you explain how a native species can end up with an alien population? Is Takalani on the line? Hello. Okay, great. We've got you. Takalani, did you hear the question? Uh, can you please um, repeat? Sure. Um, they've asked, I may have missed the definition of the native alien population. Please can you explain how a native species ends up with alien populations? Oh, oh, okay. So um, um, I said on the presentation that uh, to qualify as native alien population, we propose different um, criteria to uh, that meet um, uh, the native alien population. And that is uh, the individual has to be within a country where the species is native and that individuals are moved by direct human agency over a biogeographical barrier to an area beyond species historic native range. Thanks, Takalani, for that clarification. And I have a question for Nabuchle, who presented a poster. Uh, Angela asks, from the suitability mapping, what are some of the control measures, measures suggested to control the spread of the species? Hi, Kathleen. Uh, can you please repeat that? Sure. Um, from the suitability mapping, or what are the control measures suggested to control the spread of the species? Okay, uh, during the survey, um, during the site survey, we actually did a 10 minute um, mechanical control removal of the species. So we actually saw that it's much easier to actually pull the species because in general, we don't have any herbicides registered for the species. So as other papers have actually suggested that um, mechanical control is, is much more suitable, though it can take a lot of time or it can be time consuming. 
Thanks, Nabuchle. Thank you. Um, and I have a question for, for Manette, who also presented a poster. Uh, Manette, how would you prevent sexually driven evolution in South Africa of the species? So um, currently, we don't have the opposite mating type. So the obvious one would be not to introduce more genotypes and not to introduce the other um, mating type. Without the other mating types, sexual reproduction would not be possible in South Africa. So if we just keep our quarantine and keep on screening, just trying to prevent um, bringing more genotypes in. And, and it is, we are busy doing that. Um, people at Fabi are actively um, working with this fungus and, and looking for genotypes and just making sure that we do not have a repeated introduction into the country. So that would that be any genotypes or particularly those that are uh, sexually uh, reproducing in Malaysia? Well, um, specifically the, the MAT1 isolates, but we would definitely not want any of the Malaysian genotypes to come in, but in actual fact, we don't want any, any genotypes to come in. Oh, yeah, great, thank you. Sorry, everyone, that was, I was on mute there. Um, we have a few more questions and we've still got five minutes. Uh, so, Samalesu, another question for you from Tamelo. She asks, has the possibility of geographic or environmental variable factors, um, has the impact of these been assessed to try and explain these differences as the plants possibly occur in different biomes in the three provinces? Did you Hello, get the can question? You hear, can you, yes, I got your question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Yes. So um, I was actually saying that thanks uh, to Melo. This is a very good question. And yes, um, definitely there is um, some part of environmental factors uh, into the morphological differences um, that we're seeing in these particular species. However, I must say that um, there is a lot of um, ploidy um, level, like Opuntia um, actually are very much high ploidy um, individuals, which means that they have actually duplicated their genomes um, either through hybridization or via um, any environmental factors. So um, it is a possibility that environmental differences could actually be uh, a driven force for the differences in morphology that we see. And currently we have a student who's actually looking into that. Um, so we have actually done some um, garden transplanting where the uh, genotypes or the lineages rather from different uh, uh, um, provinces have been transplanted so that we can see what uh, the environmental factor has got on these individuals. And hopefully we can try to assess that genetically as well through the epigenetics um, uh, analysis that we're trying to do. Last questions. Um, one is to me uh, from Vukosi, who asks, is it fair enough to assume that the distribution of avian species from South Africa to other countries is mostly facilitated by transport of goods to these countries by a South African port? Uh, I think that this definitely, definitely plays a huge role, um, but also, of course, the movement of people. So people will be carrying with them um, perhaps fruit products or plants, um, and that would also definitely uh, be moving species across those, those borders. Uh, but also we, we can't underestimate the spread, the natural spread of species. Um, those three species that I, that I showed on during the presentation, they spread into South Africa through natural dispersal. So um, there's just, there's a lot going on in a lot of different ways these species are moving between our borders. And then the final question goes to Marcus. Uh, Marcus, uh, what is the contribution from European immigrants, sorry, the contribution from European immigrants is missing in the data, or is this because they do not make use of traditional medicine? Um, we can go back to Van Riebeck's diaries of the um, company garden, and we could literally start the list from there. But 
uh, and, and a lot of those plants were introduced as medicinal plants. And the, the guide that we used um, also literally has thousands and thousands of plants that have been moved around the world as medicinal plants. So not a very straightforward answer for me. I think it's because traditional medicine fell out of um, favor with Europeans and has now come back in as very, very fashionable. Um, but it's harder to locate because you know it's in clicks and it's everywhere else. I think the reason that we can do it with these markets is because the the outlets are still very well defined and closely defined. But that would be an interesting question. And in fact, fennel goes back um, to Van Riebeck as as a medicinal plant and as a culinary plant. So I think you have to be careful of the labels that you use, but definitely medicinal plants moved around the world it doesn't matter what uh, community they come from they are a problem great thanks very much marcus and uh thank you to everyone all of the presenters and to everyone for asking questions we've run out of time now um before i sign off i just also like to thank my co-facilitator manda who couldn't be here today but who's helped me plan this session and also everyone else working in the background, the two Kims, Weaver and Canavan, um, and everyone else. Thank you so much. And we will now be taking a lunch break. The next session will start at 2 p.m. The session is focuses on the establishment and spread of biological invasions and will be facilitated by Sherkat and Lorraine Straffy. So we'll see you all at 2 p.m. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>